Hello viewers, welcome back to my channel. This is Prince Bell TV. Yeah, today I brought an interesting topic. It's a topic that you guys will like. And I want us to learn a lot of things from this topic. I want us to learn a lot of things from what I'm going to discuss on this channel today. Uh, the topic today is the evil child. The evil child. The evil child. Um, there is nothing like the evil child. There's no child that is evil. That's one point I want to make clear. There is no child that is evil. Yes. Um, we have a lot of things going on in um, Africa, especially with kids. A lot of cases that you and I have seen, have learned, heard stories, how we treat um, the kids in Africa, which is very bad. We have stubborn children, extremely stubborn children. There must be a reason behind those children behaving that way. We have weird children, kids that are so weird that when you see them, they behave so strange. Something is definitely wrong why they are behaving that way. Something went wrong somewhere. No child is being born into a place and just become very, very stubborn or very weird. There is no child that is born that brought those things with them. But as soon as they, they are given back to in the society, the society offer them weirdness or wickedness, stubbornness, and all the rest of them. So they grew up and became those things. I have seen a lot of cases like in Port Court where kids are being abandoned on the streets. Kids are being labored, witches, killed, burned. Oh, this is so sad. I, I don't understand why Africans are so daft. I'm sorry to use that word, but I think some, why, is, why are we so naive? Why are Africans so naive that we can't see beyond our nose? How could you say a child is a witch? And you stone the child to death. And you kill the child. All of you came together, beat up the child until the child dies. Are you for real? How can you explain to me that a child of three years is a witch and you abandon the child on the street? A child of two is a witch and you abandon this child on the street? What is wrong with us Africans? What is wrong? Especially in my country. I was watching a video, uh, I, I was watching a documentary um, some years back when I saw a two years old child on the street begging for food. Begging for food. A child was picking rubbish on the floor to eat. When I watched that documentary, I look up to the heaven and I said, Lord, why? Why did you allow this child to come to earth? What sin has this child committed? Tears ran down my eyes. How could parents give birth to a, a baby and he's been abandoned on the streets to fend for himself? I, I just couldn't stand. I just couldn't stand it. I felt this kind of heart in my heart. I said, how did we reach there? How did we, how did we get to this level? That a kid, a baby is abandoned on the street. And the baby is looking for food by himself. You know? And, and everybody was just passing by. Nobody cares. Until this good Samaritan, a white lady all the way from Europe, came down and saw this baby on the street and 
left where she was going to pick up this child with all the debts on his body and carried this child, gave him water to drink, a potai cut. When I watched that documentary, I cried for days. I wept for days. I just couldn't imagine that this is happening. We have people passing by, driving their cars to church, driving their families to church. They are passing this little baby. Nobody cares. Nobody wants to know. Because this child is labeled a witch. Who told you this child is a witch? Who told you that? If you did not plan well, if you did not arrange yourself well, and you gave back to this child, and things are not moving well for you, why should you label the child a witch? Is it a crime that that child came through that family? But I thank God for this beautiful white lady who got sent to go and rescue that baby. I'm so happy for that child. Do you know how many kids have been abandoned in the streets of Nigeria because of this? Do you know how many kids are brought to come and serve aunties, uncles, and they label them witches, wizards, um, mermaid spirits, and all the rest of them? I'm sorry that I'm crying, but I just, every time I remember the story, I just shed tears. I'm sorry about that. Do you know how many kids are punished day in, day out? I also saw um, a case in Nigeria where a house girl, I think, I think she's about nine years old, if I'm not mistaken. The madam of the house took hot iron and ironed her buttocks. For God's sake, what kind of wickedness is this? I've seen also another story where a woman beat the house girl to death. Why are we killing kids? Why are we punishing kids for what they do not know? Are they the cause of the country being messy? Are they the cause of the country making people to lack jobs, food, and the rest of them? These kids are innocent. Now, that brings me to uh, my topic, the evil child. These two couples, they are pastors, pastor and his wife. They are Americans. Um, they were looking for child after they got married for 12 years. They didn't have any issue. And then um, they decided to um, adopt uh, some kids. Kids were um, siblings, a boy and a girl. The girl is a senior. So they adopted them. And then um, these kids were um, from, I think, that neglected them. These kids were from parents um, that the father is a drunkard. The the mom, I think, the mom died when the the daughter was one year old. When the first child was one year old, which is the girl, so. That means when she had the second child, that one was a baby. So when uh, she died, now the, the two kids were left with their father. I think that was when the father started abusing the, the daughter from the age of one. He started abusing the daughter sexually from the age of one. Until the child got to three years when this, this pastor and his wife went to adopt them. Now, let me tell you, is that child not destroyed already? 
a child that the father started abusing from the age of one will that child ever be the same it's a question i'm putting to you so this um beautiful couple adopted these siblings and brought them home and as the years passed they started noticing something that the the girl was having some kind of uh, character that a child of her age supposed not to have you know this kind of character that that associates with evil she takes pain and shooks a brother on his body she goes to the genital of the body and pull it and hurt the brother um she punches the head of the brother on the floor she does all, all sorts of things to the brother just to hurt the brother you know and then sometimes she takes knife and all that you you're going to watch the video because i'm going to i'm going to put the video after my 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 speech and then this child was busy doing all sorts of horrible things to this to the brother to the extent the the, the, the uh, adopted parents have to put a kind of um what is it called again they put um an alarm adopted parents put an alarm at a door at the girl's door so that when she comes out in the night to hurt the brother they will they will uh, get to know and protect the brother so it, it came to that extent. It was that bad. So these things were going on at a point they couldn't stand it anymore when she almost killed the brother. So they had to start looking for um, therapists. They started looking for help so that they could rescue this child. They never hated the girl. Despite all the things she was doing, she was killing all the pets in the house, killing the cats and all the birds and everything in the house. And it was not really normal because you know the white people they love pets so she was killing them so they not seek for help and then the therapist came and started interviewing the girl and then she was saying the reason why she wants to kill like she just want to kill the brother she just want to kill the brother without no remorse without no feeling she just take it as part of life because this was a child from one year old when the father was abusing her a baby who just came into this world she doesn't know her left from her right and the dad was already abusing this child what do you expect that child to be so how she knows in her life is just to hurt someone because she was being hurt to the extent this little girl Anywhere she sees herself, she masturbates. She doesn't even know what is what is masturbation. She doesn't even know what what kind of thing is that. But she does it as a little baby. Just imagine a little child. You are walking with a little child and the child just runs somewhere, sit on the floor and start mat masturbating. Is that normal? That is sickness already. That child, that child is, is in problem. So as she does masturbation, every single day according to the adoptive parents why do i keep on saying adoptive parents adopted parents she masturbates all the time at that young age what is the meaning of that so they started looking for help and then the therapist came and started asking her all sort of questions and she was answering it as a child because she doesn't see anything wrong with that she doesn't have any feeling that she's going to kill her brother or she's trying to do something evil. She doesn't know all those things. Because she's been polluted already. That was how they took her to um, a home where they kept kids like that. That have been abused. Some kids, according to uh, that home, um, they said some kids have killed. And they don't even feel remorse. They don't even care because they don't know what. That's the life they know. So they, they brought her there so that they could rehabilitate her. And get her out of this evil behavior and that was what they did I think they decided showing her love they started teaching them and at the end of the day to cut a long story short this little girl became better a better person and she went back home 
And this person I'm talking about right now, she's a matured lady now. She's working. She's fine. She's okay. But what I see in this case is that I love the way these white people react to issues. That is what I'm bringing to you guys. I love the way they react to issues. I love the way they take things upon themselves. I love the way they say, this is a problem. We know the, pro we know the cause of this problem. And let's look for a solution to end this problem. Because we have the cause of this problem. And we need to look for a solution to end this problem. Because we know that this child is just a child. We need to help this child to become somebody in the future. They were not angry of the child. They were not beating the child. They were not punishing the child. They were not even shouting at the child. Because they know that what the child was doing, the child does not know. But I bet you if it was to be in African continent, or if it were to be in Africa, they will beat the living day out of that child. They will tag that child witches and wizards. They will tag that child mommy water spirit. They will be doing fasting and praying and punishing the child with food, starving the child with food. But the whites, they never thought of those things. Despite the adopted parents were Christians. The, the adopted father was a pastor. They prayed on their own for God to intervene and they took physical action by taking this child to a therapist to help solve the situation. But if it's Africa, they start praying 21 days prayer, fasting and prayer, they will pray, call mountain, call thunder, call this, call that. There is God. Don't dispute me. I know there is God. But when you pray to God to solve your situation for you, what do you do next? You apply the physical because there's already people that God gave the wisdom to be able to address the physical, the physical issues. God takes care of the spiritual issues. And then what do we do? We give humans that God has blessed with intelligence and wisdom to take care of the physical issues. You understand me? And then both of them works together. By the time God takes care of the spiritual issue and we humans take care of the physical issue, everything works out for good to those who love him. So what am I trying to say? We attach too many spiritualities in our situation in Nigeria. We attach so many spiritualities in everything that happens to us without us attacking it in the physical aspect of it. You will be sick. Go to doctor. You will go and pray. You will pray. Nobody says you should not pray. But after you finish praying, go and see the doctor. After you finish praying, go and see the doctor. Hell no. Africans will not go and see the doctor. They will pray and they will stay put and they will die like fowl. So, my brothers and sisters out there, let us stop abusing children. If we have stubborn kids in our home, if we have evil children in our home, let's find out the root of this child behaving like this and let's find the solution. Go to therapy, take that child for a therapy. Try to see what you guys can do to be able to show that child love and care and bring that child back from where the child was. That is what we ought to do. Not to beat, burn, pour them acid, pour them hot water, use iron to burn them, beat them with ropes and cane, beat, oh my God, starve them, make them eat food from the bean, make them sleep on, 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 on the carpet, make them sleep on the floor as if they are not humans. Please. I beg you, fellow citizens, Nigerians, Africans, please, if you are in that category, to, do, to show wickedness to those innocent children, you better change. And watch this video and take some piece of advice from it. It will do us a, lot, a whole lot of good because if all of us try in our own respective places, to try to make a change, you will see that the country will be in a better place. You will see that Nigeria will be good. 
you will see that Africa in uh, general will be good. So please watch this video and pick up one or two things, learn from it, and let's make our place a better place. I want to say thank you for watching Prince Bell TV. Please, if you've never subscribed before, just go there, press the button below, and just subscribe. And if you are a returning back viewer, I love you so much. Thank you and stay tuned. Keep watching Prince Bell TV. Bye. Six years old when her deep blue eyes shocked American society after this documentary about her life was broadcasted on television. Undaunted and bored, Beth recounted how she tried to murder her younger brother when she was going to kill her parents and why she had stolen knives from the family kitchen. Despite her short life, she had suffered brutal abuse from her biological father. The girl had been diagnosed with Reactive Attachment Disorder, RAD, a condition in which young children fail to establish healthy bonds with their parents or caregivers due to extreme abuse. Her signs of psychopathy had been developed as a form of self-defense against the outside world. Beth Thomas was adopted at 19 months old, along with their 7-month-old brother Jonathan by Tim and Julie, a conservative American couple who had been married for 12 years but were unable to have children of their own. Although Tim mentioned not needing children to make their lives complete, they decided to venture into adoption as a means of sharing and transmitting the completeness. Julie seemed more excited about the idea of adoption and mentioned that it was a dream shared by both. Finally, in 1984, they were notified of the availability of adoption of Beth and Jonathan. They were surprised by the speed of the process and they were told that they were normal and healthy as if they were children without a past, like two blank books. Later, they obtained information regarding the living conditions that both children had before their adoption and discovered that the children lived in a despicable environment. Both showed signs of having been mistreated and abandoned and their food and hygiene conditions were precarious. Beth showed signs of having been sexually abused by her father and could spend a whole day alone with a box of cereal to eat. Jonathan lived reclining in a crib surrounded by urine and dirty diapers and his head was misshapen from having spent so much time in the same pose. While his back was completely flat, his forehead had bumps. The boy was seven months old and the lack of stimulation had affected his abilities. He could not raise his head or turn around. After a short time, they noticed that Beth began to show aggressive and sexual behaviors that were gradually increasing, mainly directed towards her brother, but also towards her adoptive parents and domestic animals, through hitting, kicking, the use of pins to prick them, pinching her brother's genitals, self-injurious genital masturbation in public places, and confessions about wanting to kill Jonathan, Tim, and Julie. When they were overwhelmed by this situation, they decided to take Beth to Dr. Ken Maggot, a clinical psychologist specializing in abused children, who conducted this interview with Beth, presented in the video when she was six and a half years old. Who's afraid of you, Beth? John. Your brother. And what is your brother, why is your brother afraid of you? Because I hurt him so much. Mm-hmm. Okay. And... What, at nighttime, what do your parents do to your door? Lock it shut. Mm, why do they lock it shut? Because they don't want me to hurt John. Right. And they're kind of afraid of, of hurting John? Are you hurting John? Mm -hmm. Okay. Are they afraid that you might hurt them? Yep. During the session with the therapist, Beth was distant and jaded. She seemed destined to be a murderer and lacking any ounce of empathy. Would you, Beth? Mm-hmm. When would you do it? Nighttime. Okay. Why would you do nighttime? Because I don't like them seeing me do it. But they can tell me do it. Mm -hmm. And what would you do to them, Beth? Okay. What would you stick them with? A knife. Do you ever stick pins in people? Mm -hmm. Who? My brother. Okay. Do you do it a little bit or a lot? A lot. Okay. And what are you trying to do to your brother? No. Um, Why do you want your brother to die? Because I was hurt so bad and I don't want 
to be around people. Okay. Who else would you like to stick pins into? Mommy and Daddy. What would you like to have happen to them? Da. Jesus couldn't have lived to save Israel. He had to chose to die to save the world. Tim is the minister of a small Methodist church in the South. He and his wife, Julie, have been married for 12 years. Unable to have children of their own, they decided to adopt. In February of 1984, they received a call from the Department of Social Services telling them they had two children available for adoption. They were told that Beth, 19 months old, and her brother Jonathan, 7 months old, were normal and healthy. We did not need children to make our lives complete. We felt secure in ourselves and secure in our relationship, but we wanted to share that with somebody else, and we felt like we had a lot to pass on to a child, and that was what we really wanted to do. And when the phone call came, it was like, at last is here. It seemed like a miracle. It had happened so quick. We had heard of couples having to wait five, ten years on, on a child, and here we had two young children. Um, it was like the answer to our dream. Their dream became a nightmare when they realized that Beth and Jonathan had severe emotional problems. Beth and her brother Eric were children of a dysfunctional family. His father was an alcoholic and his mother neglected early child rearing, also passing away a year and a half after Eric's birth. They had an older sister, but she was hardly home since she worked in a strip club. Her father sexually abused Beth from birth to three years, at which point social services took care of the children. We had the kids with us, uh, Beth and her younger brother John, for uh, probably a couple of months until we began to learn something about their background and their past. And when we learned that uh, something seemed to fall in place about her behavior and John's behavior, uh, from several sources we discovered that uh, that they didn't have enough food to eat, um, that perhaps even <clears throat> Beth went all day maybe with just a box of kick cereal. John himself was found in a, a bassinet with uh, little patches of urine all over it and a dirty diaper and a couple of bottles at his feet that had curdled milk and the back of his head was completely flat. Uh, the front of his head had bulged out and at uh, seven months, he couldn't raise his head, couldn't roll over. Um, he was uh, just had had no stimulation, and uh, we think perhaps that didn't happen to Beth. And it wasn't very long until uh, she began showing some signs of perhaps uh, even some abuse. Uh, there was a nightmare uh, that she had, and the nightmare was about uh, a man who was falling on her and uh, hurting her with a part of himself. Tell me about your birth father. What was that nightmare like? When she touched my vagina. Okay. Until it bled. Hurt it a lot until it bled. And, um, wouldn't be me a lot. He'd hit on me. Wouldn't be very nice to me. How old were you? One. And in your nightmare, what happens? I get real scared. Where are you in the nightmare? What happens in the dream? I'm in the house, upstairs. And then what happens then? When he comes upstairs and, um, hurts. How do you feel when you talk about this? Where's your birth? Where's your birth father? What's he doing? He's right there, and there's his hand. His hand's right there. Where? Right there. You can't hardly see it because it's green. What's it touching? My vagina. And what is your birth father doing? Heart nut. Your face looks uh, sad. Can you tell me about that? Mm-hmm. It's crying because the thoughts of the tears. 
When referring to the nightmares in which a man fell on her and hurt her, Beth implies that she was sexually assaulted by her father. The repercussions of the abuse she had suffered as a child had led to uncontrollable anger. Beth had endured severe neglect and abuse as a child. Her birth mother died when she was one. Because of these early childhood experiences, Beth never developed a sense of conscience, love, or trust for anyone. The early sexual abuse by her birth father would cause her to exhibit inappropriate sexual behavior, especially toward her brother. Does your brother have private parts? Um. Yeah. Yeah. What are the, what is his private parts? Penis and butt. Mm -hmm. And what do you do with your brother with his private parts, Ben? I hurt it. Tell me about it. What do you do? Well, I pinch it. Um, squeeze it. Kick it. When you do things to your brother's private parts, what does he say? Stop. Okay, tell me that. Well, he says stop, but I don't stop. Do you hurt him? Mm -hmm. A lot. Okay. And would you like to do that to other boys? <laughs> When I, I caught her with Jonathan one morning, she was molesting him. Um, he was crying and his pants were down, and I said, Beth, what's happening? And she said, I pulled his penis and put my finger up his anus. And uh, I said, didn't he say to stop? And she said, yeah, he did. And I said, did you? And she said, no. Beth and her brother Jonathan had lived alongside their biological father in a state of total abandonment. Also, as a result of her pain, Beth sexually harassed her brother. Have you ever rubbed your private parts? Mm -hmm. Do you do it a lot? A lot. How much do you do that? Not every single day, and that seems to... I did it every single day until it got... Well, bad and I stopped and I had to get to the doctor and I did not like it. What, what do you mean by real bad? Well, it looked real raw, got all kinds of boogers on it, germs, mm -hmm. a lot of stuff from my hand. And it bled? Mm-hmm. She started to masturbate at inappropriate times. Um, I remember one time, typically, when we were at the hospital waiting for Tim to come out, he was there visiting. And Beth and John were in the back seat, and I turned around, and, and she had her legs spread and was masturbating in a public parking lot. And I had tried to explain to her new, numerous times before that, that that's private area. You don't do it in public places. And um, gone over that with her, and, and it never seemed to face her. And... Um, Julie, how often would your daughter masturbate? Daily. Constantly. Do you have animals, Beth? Four of them. Can you tell me their names? Cloudy, Shuggy, Darcy, and Annie. And Daddy said um, a day ago that um, there was a stray cat who did not have a home, so Daddy is, was taking care of it. And took it to the vet when he started, when he had his flight to go. And what do you do to the animals, Beth? Stick them with pants. Do you stick them a little bit or a lot? A lot. What are you trying to do to the animals, Beth? Kill them. What do they do when you stick them with the pins? Well, Annie cries. She's a dog. She got baby birds down out of the nest, and we thought maybe she was just curious. So we explained that she could hurt them, um, put them back, and went through a whole sitting down and talking to her about the problem of it. And the next day, we went out to check the baby birds, and they were on the ground dead with her, their necks broken. Let's talk about what happened once when you were smaller, when you 
when you found some baby birds in a, in a tree. What, what did you do then? I took them out. Mm -hmm. And what did Mom say to you? Um, that the mother will not come back if somebody touches her baby. Mm -hmm. Are the baby birds kind of small? Can you describe them for me? Well, they don't have their eyes open, but they can hear, hear me and they look up. Are they kind of helpless? Little baby birds? Can they fly? No. Can they run away? Uh, yes. They can? Are they easy to catch or hard to catch? Hard? Yeah. Well, it's hard to remember. With the baby birds, what did you do? Took them out of the tree. And what did you do with them? Played around to us. Also, when at the end, I picked it up and I saw it was dead, and I came to say, Mommy, is this bird dead? And she said, um... She called Daddy and said, Tim, and, um, and Daddy came and, um, I think I remember that they said yes. Mm -hmm. And so, so did the little baby birds die? I don't know. You don't remember? I just remember that I... I think I remember that Mommy and Daddy said the last bird we got was dead. Mm -hmm. Do you know what Mom said to me? She said that all of them were dead. Did you squeeze them? Did Baby Ben squeeze them? You're doing a good job, honey. Go ahead and tell me what happened. I squeezed them. And what happened? They died. Beth also wanted to kill her parents with a knife. And although she had never killed a human being, she tortured family pets and even killed birds. The way she says it means she is oblivious of the pain she inflicts on others. But this kind of aggression at our animals and even uh, at her brother Jonathan was beginning to, uh, to grow to such an excess that our life was miserable at home. We had, John would cry uh, in the mornings and say his stomach hurt. We, for the longest time, we thought maybe this child has, uh, uh, has some problem with his intestinal area or maybe he has allergies, and so we're trying to get all that checked out. Come to find out, Beth was coming out of her room and hitting him in the stomach. And so as a last resort, just to protect him, we had to tie her door shut. So I guess for what, the last three or four months now, we've had to tie her in at night, sort of barricade her. Other times, the girl waited until her parents did not see her to hit her younger brother hard on the stomach. In addition, she was sticking pins into her. The situation was unmanageable for the parents who could not control the girl. To protect the brother, they placed the latch on Beth's room and locked her in at night to prevent her from continuing to do harm. The repercussions of Beth's tragic childhood led to uncontrollable rage. Despite the love and nurturing of her adoptive parents, she took this rage out on herself, on her brother, and on them. Her acts of violence became more and more cruel and frightening. Well, I noticed several, uh, like paring knives in the kitchen, missing. And my first thought was Beth. And I felt a little guilty about it at first. I thought, no. Nah. But um, I, I really didn't even mention it to her. They had been gone several weeks. She was sitting at the table drawing and mentioned to me, what do those knives look like that are gone, Mom? And I said, what knives, Beth? And um, she said, weren't they kind of silver and about this big? And um, I knew then, and then this little smile that's not, not a sweet smile, but a malicious type of smile. And I knew then, I thought, she's got them. Tell me about the knives. Where did you get them? From the drawer. 
and we're out. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. Tell me about it. I got them from the dishwasher. What kind of knives? Um. Big shot ones. And what do you want to do with those knives? Kill John and Mommy with them and Daddy. Beth? frankly admits that she wishes to kill both her adoptive parents. Her acts of violence were increasingly cruel and chilling, to the point where she now had the weapons to accomplish the killing. And when Mommy asks you about where the knives are, what do you say? she might do with the knives my first thought was jonathan uh, and the reason we thought that was that she had by this time she had tried to kill john on several occasions and, and openly admitted that in the basement she was hitting his head against a cement floor i heard his screams and ran down and had to literally pull her hands off and she looked wild-eyed did you get real mad at him did you hit his head real hard? Tell me about it. What? Did, how many times did you do it? A lot. What was the floor like? Same up. And what happened to your brother? Tell me about it. His head hurt real bad, but his chin he had to have stitches in it. Could you stop? Use your words, Beth. Okay. What was your brother doing when you were doing this? Playing with the, with the toys. Okay. Was he asking you to stop when you when you were doing it? What was he saying? He was saying, Beth, stop. And what did you do? I didn't stop. I just kept on... Uh, what were you thinking when you were doing that? Thinking of killing him. How did you stop? Mm. What made you stop? When I heard Peter walking across the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And then he stopped because I thought Mommy and Daddy were coming. Okay. Did mommy come? What did she do? She sent me to my room. Okay. Um, and what if mom didn't stop you? What would you have done? Kept on doing it. Beth's outbursts of violence were directed especially against Jonathan, who on one occasion had to be hospitalized after the girl repeatedly hit his head on a concrete floor in an attempt to take his life. If not for her parents, this would certainly have happened. It was clear now that Beth had a psychological problem. And what about, what about After evaluating the extent of Beth's psychological problems, Dr. McGid felt that for the well-being of the family, Beth needed to be temporarily separated from them. In April of 1989, her parents brought her to a special home with an expert at raising children with early attachment disorders especially children who are dangerous to themselves and others. I have children that have killed numerous times. Cold-blooded family members, neighbor children, killed them. And they can do it. Makes my blood run cold just thinking about nine years old. People don't think a nine-year-old is capable of cold-blooded murder, but they are. That attachment break does severe damage to the heart, the ability to care and the ability to love. They don't care and they don't love. They're capable of anything. We're very strict. 
very strict about everything. Everything is completely monitored. We take complete control because a child who's unattached does not trust. And because they don't trust, they don't allow anybody to be boss of them. So we take complete control. They are not boss of anything. They have to ask to get a drink of water. They have to ask to go to the bathroom. They have to ask to leave our site. Part of that is because we cannot trust them because of the damage that they've done before. Worried about the situation, her adoptive parents tried to help her in different ways and took her to countless specialists. The aggressions were incessant to the point that it was impossible to continue a healthy life. Everything changed when they met the therapist, Ken Maggot, a clinical psychologist specializing in abused children and victims of serious abuse, so traumatized during the first years of life that they do not establish emotional ties with other people. The doctor worked with children who could not accept love who had no conscience and who could hurt and even kill without remorse. The proposal was an intensive behavior modification therapy and part of the sessions with Beth were recorded and formed part of the documentary. After assessing the extent of Beth's psychological problems, the specialist decided that it was best to separate her from the rest of the family. In April, 1989, the girl was taken to a specialized residence for children with attachment disorders that are danger to themselves and others. There, Beth lived with minors who had murdered in cold blood. The therapy consisted of imposing extreme restrictions. Beth had to ask permission for everything, including drinking water and going to the bathroom. Part of the goal was to rebuild Beth's self-esteem so that she perceived herself as a person of value. Uh, Beth, would you like to say grace, please? Sure. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this good day. And everybody doing good. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 They believe that they're evil. They believe they're from the devil. They believe that they are not a person of value. And we have to change that. And we have to build that from a child who's nothing, who's, who's a bad kid in their own mind, to a child who's valuable and loving, and they see themselves as that. When they do a chore well, we can say, you did a good job, you're a good worker. And then it just builds that self-esteem little by little so that they change the way that they see themselves. Several months into treatment in this controlled environment, Beth had made progress, and her therapist decided to loosen some of the controls. Anybody wants some more? Beth continued to show signs of improvement. She began to develop a sense of right and wrong. She seemed to respond to affection. It was more outgoing. She went to public school, made friends at the local church, and even sang in the choir. Are you going to go into Sunday school? Yes. To get stickers? Maybe you could put one on your nose. Mm -hmm. A beard. She's beard. There's his nose, and that's his. Oh, I see. Yeah, see, his beard is kind of flowing in the wind and everything. Elijah taking up in the heaven, the fiery chariot. Huh? Well, that's that's where that's Elisha. That's the the other prophet that took Elijah's place. And he was left, and, and there's Elijah. You know, and he learned about sheep. And the Lord is my shepherd. March 3rd, you just got that yesterday, huh? In the beginning, we couldn't trust her with anything. She was locked up at night. We had alarms on the door at night, so she wasn't sneaking around doing things with the other children. We don't worry about that anymore. There's no alarm on her door at night now. She sleeps in the same room with my own daughter, and I trust her that much. She brushes the dogs, and I trust her that much. Because she has earned that trust, she's learned it, she's, she has a heart, and she has a love inside, and she feels bad when she does something now. In the past, because she didn't have a conscience, she didn't feel anything when she did something bad. There was just no feeling there. And now she does feel bad, and it shows in her face. I believe that Beth can make it. She's got 
a really bright mind. She's got a good heart now, which has done a lot of healing. She's got a really super set of parents. They're powerful, they're knowledgeable, they're motivated. Um, she's done a lot of good work with you in therapy, with Canal and with myself. She wants to heal, and that's the number one key. And she wants to heal because she has a family that really cares about her, and she wants to be with her. Animal therapy also helped her empathize. In the controlled environment, Beth was showing signs of improvement, was even beginning to develop a differentiation between good and bad. At home, she also had to feed various farm animals and seemed to respond to affection. She laughed and interacted with other living beings and even hugged her therapist. Gradually, Beth began to have more contact with other children, was sent to school, became friends at church, and began participating in a choir. With less than a year of therapy, Beth's attitude changed radically. Do you know where that anger came from? That's when my birth dad um, hurt me. I, I had it all inside and I remembered it. And I started doing it. And what did, what did that do when it was inside you? It made me to hurt people really bad. And who did you hurt? My brother, my mom and dad, and animals. And animals. Who did it hurt the most? My brother. Who did it hurt the me. most? Me. Why don't you tell me that? It hurt, it hurt me the most. How did it hurt you the most? Because when I hurt other people, um... It had only been a couple of months since Beth had admitted that her wish was to murder her brother and her parents, but the change was resounding. The girl expressed regret for how she had treated her brother. She no longer harmed herself and lamented for having hurt people. After passing through the residence, Beth began to feel empathy and regretted having hurted her loved ones. I'm hurting my, um, dead self. How do you feel right now, Beth? Bad. It's kind of tough to talk about, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Beth gave her last interview for this film in December of 1989. Although she had made progress, she would still need extensive therapy. Not all abused children are as deeply scarred as Beth, but all abused children suffer a profound hurt for the rest of their lives. The road to recovery is long and hard for the abused child. There are more than one million new victims of child abuse in America every year. Over the years, we can see Beth as a person with the capacity to empathize and to be aware of the consequences of her actions. Obviously, her apparent evil had its genesis in the continued abuse of which she was a victim as a baby, and her case serves to illustrate the dire consequences of physical and psychological abuse at a young age. Currently, Beth leads a normal life and works as a nurse. Her professional merits have earned her several awards. This case leads us to the following conclusions. The importance of good parenting, especially in critical periods of the child but it also tells us about the effectiveness, at least in this case, of psychological therapy, even in cases of extreme gravity and that may seem irreconcilable. This total psychological recovery of small Beth could be achieved by raising awareness to the child about their actions, to mend their self-esteem and build the habits and social behavior functional, for example, getting to accept certain standards and to manage, channel, and understand the reason for their anger.